Good morning, everybody. Welcome back for uh, this new IAEA colloquium. Today, uh, we will have uh, the talk by Dr. Anja Feldmeier Krause, and uh, she will talk about the Milky Way nuclear star cluster. Uh, Dr. Feldmeier will be introduced by uh, Isabel Martins. Please, Isabel. Thank you, Rene. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for being here again for uh, what Lockheed from our Severo to our program. Today, it's a pleasure to have with us uh, Anja Feldmeier Krause. Thank you very much, Anja, for having accepted our, our invitation. It's a pleasure for us to have you here. Um, Anja Feldmeier Krause studied physics at the uh, Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich. For her, her PhD uh, in, in astronomy, she worked at ESO in Garchin and analyzed the Milky Way nuclear star cluster as stellar kinematics and constructed dynamical models. She also investigated star populations of the inner region of the Milky Way uh, nuclear stellar cluster. After graduating from Leiden University in 2016 under the supervision of Tim Dizu, she worked at the University of Chicago with uh, Wendy Freeman, Friedman on star population and initial mass uh, function gradients in early type galaxies. Uh, since 2020, she works at the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in Heidelberg in the group of the Nadine Neumeyer on topics related to stellar populations and kinematics of the Milky Way's nuclear star cluster and nuclear star disk. In, in the talk today, uh, Anya will present the results for more than 1500 stellar spectra of the nuclear star cluster. Based on these data, she will show the spatial distribution of uh, young old uh, young stars, so a few uh, uh, mega years old, the metallicity distribution of the older, so having several gigabyte red giant stars, and spatial variations of the metallicity distribution. So um, uh, um, I say it again, thank you very much, Anya, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the nice introduction and also for inviting me to present my work. Um, can you now see my slide? Yes, we can. Yes, great. Yeah, so I will talk about the Milky Way nuclear star cluster and with a focus on what we can learn from K-band spectroscopy. So first, I would like to show you this beautiful illustration of our galaxy, the Milky Way. Um, this is where we are located in the local arm of this beautiful spiral galaxy. And um, there are several spiral arms and in the center we have this bar to observe the galactic center. Um, we have to look through all of these spiral arms, through four spiral arms and the bar. And the galactic center is at a distance of eight kiloparsecs. But of course, this is not how we observe the galaxy. We see it edge on because we are living inside of the Milky Way. And this is um, what was observed with Gaia. This is basically the full sky. And here we have the galactic center. But there are um, gas and dust lanes um, that belong to the spiral arms here. And they also obscure the galactic center. And I will talk a bit more about this issue later. Here we have the galactic center region in the mid-infrared. This was observed with the Spitzer Space Telescope. And here the extent of the image along um, the x-axis is about 300 parsec. This and all the other images that I will show you are in galactic coordinates. So the galactic north is always up and the galactic east is to the left. And um, this is just to give you an overview of what is in the galactic center. There are many things, it's, um, but it's also quite confusing. There are so many things. We have, of course, the nuclear star cluster. That will be the main topic of this talk. It has an effective radius of four to five parsec. So effective radius means half of the light that is emitted by the nuclear star cluster comes from the region within this radius. It is not perfectly spherical. It is flattened with a minor to major axis ratio of 0.7 to 0.8. And it has a mass of roughly 30 million solar masses. In the center of the nuclear star cluster, we have a radio source called Sagittarius A star. And this is the supermassive black hole of our galaxy. Surrounding the nuclear star cluster, we have the nuclear stellar disk. It, is, uh, it has a radius of about 230 parsecs and a scale height of roughly 30 to 40 parsecs. 
and um, a mass of several times um, 10 to the 8 solar masses. And within these main structures, we also have um, young star clusters. Um, there are quite famous the Arches cluster here and Quintuplet. And also in the very center of the nuclear star cluster, we have another cluster, so a cluster within a cluster. It's called the Central Parsec Cluster of Young Stars. So all these three clusters have ages of a few million years and masses of a few times 10 to the four solar masses. <clears throat> but there's also a lot of gas and dust in this region, which uh, you see a bit better in the eight micron image of Spitzer, where we have the dust emission. There are H2 regions, um, for example, the Tetris B1, there are also giant molecular clouds. Um, here's the famous brick, which is very dense. And uh, also star formation is going on in this region. We also see that the molecular gas is not um, distributed um, symmetrically around in the galactic center. So there's more gas and dust emission in the galactic east compared to the west. And here we have a radio image um, that was observed with Meerkat. And then yet other things pop up. We have uh, various supernova remnants, as for example here. And then there are these weird um, long filaments. They are can be 100 parsec longs, and they are probably magnetized and maybe connected with past activity of the supermassive black hole. Okay, so the supermassive black hole, of course, we have all seen in the image that was um, taken by the Event Horizon Telescope and published in spring this year. Um, so we know for sure that we have a supermassive black hole. Its mass and distance are also very uh, well known. We know them with a high precision because these um, the stars around the supermassive black hole were monitored over decades. And from the stellar orbits, one can derive the mass and distance of the black hole. And these measurements were also awarded with the Nobel Prize in Physics um, two years ago. And we know that the black hole is also um, interacting with its surrounding. For example, there are radio observations that have found a jet. And um, so here we have in pink the radio and in, no, in pink the X-ray. Sorry. And in blue, we have the radio. So there are ionized gas streamers here in blue in the radio. And we have, uh, we see a shock front here and in pink. So in x ray, there is a jet. This is an image of the central Parsec region. But when we look um, with uh, the Fermi satellite and an all sky image of the of um, so it's an all sky image. So it's here we have the galactic plane. This is in gamma um, radiation. There are these two um, lobes of gamma ray emission. They are perpendicular to the galactic plane and appear to be centered on the galactic center. So it was suggested that those were created in the in a more active past of Sagittarius A star and possibly there was a jet and um, created these Fermi bubbles. But it's also possible that they are somehow connected with past star formation activity. And um, here we see the X-ray chimneys. So uh, this is now again a little bit closer to the supermassive black hole. So a scale of a couple of hundred parsecs. And we have X-ray emission um, north and south of the black hole and this these so-called X-ray chimneys are connecting the supermassive black hole with the basis of the Fermi bubble. So maybe the energy is transported through the X-ray chimneys to the Fermi bubbles. Okay, then um, the nuclear stellar disk. Um, such um, objects are also found in other galaxy centers. Here we have three examples of galaxies. These are all in BART galaxies. And they have these, um, when we zoom in, these separate structures. Sometimes it's a nuclear ring. It can be a disk or even a bar. And um, they were found in various galaxies of various types, so in ellipticals, but also in spirals and in barred galaxies, like our Milky Way. 
the timer survey had um, muse data of um, BART galaxies and they analyzed the stellar populations. And what they found is that the ages of nuclear stellar disk can be less than five giga years and up more than 10 giga years. So they can have quite a big range. And this is also shown here. The, the, the x-axis is for different galaxies and the blue um, symbol, the blue circle denotes the nuclear stellar disk. And in comparison, the green squares are for the surrounding galaxy. And what we have is that usually the nuclear stellar disk is younger than the surrounding galaxy, and it's also more metal rich. And what they also did is they looked at the outer region of the nuclear disks, which they called nuclear rings. So these are the orange triangles. And usually the outer region of the nuclear disk is younger than the inner region. And that's why they suggested that nuclear stellar disk form inside out. So first the inner part forms and then later the outer parts. And when we compare this with the star formation of the Milky Way, um, for the Milky Way, we know that about 90% of the stars are several giga years old, likely older than eight giga years. But there are also bursts of star formation that happened more recently. Um, there's um, the nuclear stellar disk are believed to form in situ. So we have gas that is transported to the center of the galaxy and their star formation happens. To transport the gas um, in the very central 150 parsecs, um, this can happen through the bar. It was shown in simulations that the Milky Way bar will um, cause an inflow rate of one solar mass per year, which would be sufficient to form the nuclear stellar disk. And now the nuclear star clusters. As for nuclear stellar disk, we have really um, separate stellar components when we look in the centers of galaxies. And here we need very high spatial resolution. So when we zoom in to these um, galaxies with an HST or a JWST, then we see these separate components, these star clusters. They are quite common and were detected in um, about 80% of galaxies in a certain mass range of various Hubble types. Their sizes are about one to 10 parsecs typically. The Milky Way nuclear star cluster is quite in the, is right in the middle of that range with four to five parsecs. And their masses are 10 to the five to 10 to the eight solar masses. And here the Milky Way nuclear star cluster is a bit on the higher end of this range. And these, these properties means that nuclear star clusters are the densest stellar systems that we know. They are denser than ultra compact dwarfs or globular clusters. We have basically um, two ways in which um, nuclear star clusters can grow. One is that stars uh, form outside of the galactic center, but um, this means they form ex situ. But these star clusters will then migrate to the center of the galaxy. This is just a consequence of dynamical friction. And then they will merge. This is illustrated in this n body simulation here by Fabio Antonini. We have screenshots where we have an infalling star cluster that moves um, in the central 20 parsecs around the center of the galaxy. And we see that it's um, getting closer to the center. Here it's already losing stars, it will be disrupted. Finally, the stars will be in the center of the galaxy. And this process uh, likely dominates in low mass galaxies. The other way to form nuclear star clusters is via gas accretion and in situ star formation. I already mentioned that, mentioned that the bar can bring gas into the central 150 parsec, but it's no longer efficient to bring gas into the central parsecs. So we need something else. And it was suggested that supernova feedback can bring gas into the central parsecs. This was studied in simulations and with a time average of 0 0.03 solar masses per year. But it's possible that other things contribute as well. Um, for example, stellar feedback from AGB stars, magnetic fields, maybe there's a nuclear bar, and um, also massive perturbers might be able to bring gas into the central 
parsecs of the galaxy. This process is likely dominant in high mass galaxies. And because of these two different processes, we have very different star formation histories in nuclear star clusters. So this is from um, a paper by Katya Farion. She, she analyzed the stellar, the star formation histories in about, I think, 20 nuclear star clusters in the Fornax cluster <clears throat> with MUSE data. So for example, in this nuclear star cluster, we have um, the mass fraction as a function of metallicity. Here, most of the stars have supersolar metallicity. There are also some subsolar metallicity stars, but both are very old, older than 10 giga years. So here we have likely in situ star formation, and this might then be ex situ formation and migration to the center. For this um, nuclear star cluster, there appears to be just in situ um, formation, also for this one, but here we have uh, younger ages, so this happened later. These two nuclear star clusters um, have broad metallicity distributions, subsolar. So um, we think that there is um, that several globular clusters contributed to the formation of the nuclear star cluster, and they had simply ranges of metallicities, which led to this broad metallicity distribution in the nuclear star cluster. But there are also signs of um, younger stellar populations. So this could be in situ formation that happened more recently because this is at a younger age. And this is the nuclear star cluster that I found um, to be most similar to what we think we have in the Milky Way if we make some adjustments. So when we change the x-axis a bit, in the Milky Way, we have mostly old stars, several giga years old. And they have, however, a broad metallicity distribution, and I will talk more about that later. And there are also um, subsolar metallicity stars. <clears throat> yeah, so um, to summarize the first part, we have nuclear star clusters, nuclear stellar disks, and supermassive black hole. They are distinct structures in galaxies. They are very uh, common in galaxies, and they interact with the larger surrounding galaxy structures. So if we really want to fully understand our galaxy or galaxies in general, we also have to understand the centers of these of galaxies. And I am observer, so to understand the galactic center, I use observations. But we have a couple of challenges that we face when we want to observe the galactic center. One is the very high extinction, which um, I already mentioned earlier. So um, extinction is caused by all this interstellar gas and dust when we look through the spiral arms and through the bar. This means this extinction makes every star fainter. So in the optical, in the V-band, extinction is 30 magnitudes, meaning at 10 magnitude stars will suddenly be 40 magnitudes, and this is too faint and we cannot observe it. However, extinction depends on the wavelength. So when we are looking at longer wavelengths in the near infrared, extinction goes down. And this is shown here in this plot where we have extinction as a function of um, wavelength. In the C-band, it's still about 20 magnitudes. But when we go to the K-band, we see how the extinction goes down. And in the images, we see how more and more stars pop up when we go to longer wavelengths. The K-band is in the sweet spot that we have um, relatively low extinction, but we are still dominated by the stellar light and not the dust emission. But also in the K-band, uh, we have a variation of the extinction. It varies on arc second scales, so there are regions with higher and lower extinction. As you see in this extinction map, this is um, showing the same region as this image here. And we see there are regions with extinction of only about 1.6 magnitudes. And there we have a lot of stars. And then there are regions where we don't have many stars, but very high extinction. Then the second challenge is, I already mentioned, we have very dense stellar systems. So we need a high spatial resolution. Otherwise, there will be a lot of crowding of all of the stars. So uh, one thing to help this is, of course, go to a bigger telescope. But even with a bigger telescope, at some point you have seeing limitations, and then ideally you have adaptive optics. 
However, usually adaptive optics works on relatively small field of views. And this is in conflict with our third challenge. This is the relatively large extent on the sky. So we need a large field of view to um, study the galactic center. The radius of the nuclear star cluster is about two arc minutes. And of course, the nuclear stellar disk is a lot bigger with uh, a radius of 1.6 degrees. <clears throat> okay, so um, of course you probably know that there are many um, all sky surveys, large um, scale surveys going on in the present. So these are great, of course, because you get spectra of hundreds of thousands or millions of stars. And I listed some of these surveys, some are all sky surveys. And they really boost our knowledge of how the Milky Way is built up about the halo, the bar and the disk. But um, the thing is that they do not fulfill all of our observational challenges. And um, so I will show you how this is a problem. We have, of course, some of these, they observe only in the Northern Hemisphere, so they cannot observe the galactic center. This is the case for Lamos and also Weave and Desi are too far north. So they simply do not observe the galactic center and also Gala did not observe it. Then um, we have the next requirement, the near infrared wavelengths, of course. This unfortunately means that Gaia does not observe any galactic center stars because it's only optical. And also foremost and PFS um, cannot observe um, stars in the galactic center. PFS works in the J band and it's in Hawaii. So it's also relatively far in the North. So it, we cannot really uh, learn anything about the galactic center. So we are um, left with Apogee and the uh, follow-up SDSS-5 and with Moons. Okay, so both of these work in the H-band. So we still have extinction of 4.5 magnitudes and both of these have relatively high spectral resolution of almost 20, of about 20,000. So this is actually great because then you can also measure abundances and Apogee has of course done this already for plenty of stars. Apogee one and two are already completed and they observed also stars in the galactic center, but really just very few of them. And it's also a wonderfully calibrated. However, it's on a 2.5 meter telescope. It will observe mainly bright stars, um, brighter than um, 11th magnitude in H band, and we only have 10 such stars in the nuclear star cluster. In principle, it would be able to observe um, up to 14 magnitudes, but in such a crowded system as in the nuclear star cluster, it probably will not get very good signal for many stars. Um, moons will be um, a spectrograph also observing in the H band and it will be on the VLT. So this means a bigger telescope. We can observe also fainter stars and they are really uh, planning to observe the galactic plane and also the galactic center region, which is shown here in blue. But their plan for now is to observe only 200 stars in the nuclear star cluster. So both of these um, will only observe really the tip of the tip of the iceberg of the nuclear star cluster, because 200 stars is really just um, scratching the surface of the 30 million stars we have there. That's why we have our, we started uh, another spectroscopic survey in the K-band. And for this survey, we used KMOS. This is the K-band multi-object spectrograph. The name says this, it, it works in the K-band, so near infrared, this is great. It has a spectral resolution of 4,000. It's on the VLT, so we have an eight meter telescope, but it will be see, it's seeing limited. There is no adaptive optics behind KMOS. And with KMOS, you, can, you have 24 IFUs, so you can observe 24 targets simultaneously in a 7.2 arc minute fields. So this would um, roughly be this size on the Spitzer image. 
but you can also observe in mosaic mode. And this is what um, I did. So you place the 24 IFUs close together as is shown here. So the, the red squares are where the IFUs are. And then you need, however, 16 offsets to fill the entire mosaic. So one IFU will of the 16 dealers have observed this area. <clears throat> and on the Spitzer image, one mosaic would have roughly this size. Here we see um, the central mosaic. It covers an area of four parsec squared. And one IFU, unfortunately, here was not working. This happens sometimes. And then you have this um, gap in the data. And we matched the um, the spectroscopic data with the photometry of the galactic nucleus survey. This gives us J, uh, H, and K band photometry. Here you see a color magnitude diagram of the Milky Way nuclear star cluster. A color magnitude diagram, just for a reminder, means we have the temperature on the x axis and the luminosity on the y axis. And this is what is being observed with the galactic nucleus survey. It's quite a wide range of colors. And we also have stars here that are very blue, but um, these stars are actually foreground stars. So they sit in the spiral arms and not in the galactic center. So we can actually identify foreground stars and um, thus clean our data set. So we get really stars in the galactic center. After extinction correction, we see here that we have the red giant branch and the red clump. And um, however, there's still quite a spread in the colors. So um, there's not a clear main sequence, which would be here because the extinction just varies so much. And we need spectroscopy to classify stars as red giant or, or, or B-type main sequence star. What we observe is not as deep as this um, color magnitude diagram. We observe mainly stars that are above this line and not really red clump stars. And here we see some typical spectra in the K-band. These are the um, red giant stars. These are most of the spectra we have. We see that the flux is increasing with wavelength. This is because extinction also plays a role uh, within the K-band here. And there are plenty of absorption lines like um, sodium, calcium, and very prominent CO. And we can um, actually measure the depth of an absorption line by using the equivalent width. So we measure the flux in the region of the absorption line and um, divided by the flux that we get um, if we had a flat continuum. And this gives us the equivalent width. And it was shown that for CO, this is a function of temperature. So the cooler stars will have um, higher um, deeper CO lines and a higher value of the equivalent width. And when we get to very shallow CO, and sometimes um, it even disappears, this means we have hot stars. This is the example of a spectrum from a hot star. This is an O or B type main sequence star. There's no CO, but instead we have bracket gamma, sometimes also helium here in absorption. So we can measure the bracket gamma equivalent width. And in a couple of stars, we will even get bracket gamma in emission. And these are usually um, Wolf-Rayet stars. So these are post main sequence stars. So we used um, our data and we could, it classified stars in hot stars, OB stars, wolf -Rayet stars, or red giant stars. In the center for parsec squared, we have 1000 stars. And here you see the spatial distribution of the hot uh, young stars, so OB and wolf -E type stars. And you see that they are very centrally concentrated. We can look at the cumulative distribution of these stars. And then we see that about 90% of the early type stars, here shown in blue, they have a distance of less than 0.4 parsec from the supermassive black hole. And this strong central concentration indicates that they formed in C2 within the nuclear star cluster. The late type stars for comparison are distributed all over the nuclear star cluster. 
so they are located everywhere. And because these spectra have so many um, absorption lines, we can actually measure some stellar parameters. We can measure the metallicity of about 700 red giant stars there. Um, so here we had to make some quality cuts. That's why it's fewer than the 1,000 stars I showed you on the previous slide. So we have 700 red giant stars that are bright enough for full spectral fitting. We use the code STARKIT and the Phoenix spectral library of synthetic spectra. Here you see three examples of stars with a similar temperature, but um, very different metallicity. In black, you see the data, and in red, the best fit spectrum. And what we see is clearly that with increasing metallicity, the absorption lines get um, deeper. However, um, it's worth noting that for the very highest uh, metallicity, sometimes the models are not do not give um, lines that are deep enough um, to fit the data. And this is probably because the, um, these, these high metallicities, we cannot really calibrate our um, model spectra. There are just no empirical spectra at such high metallicities. So this means um, we know that these stars have supersolar metallicity, but we do not think they have a metallicity of um, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 dex as this metallicity distribution would show. But still, um, we know that they have quite a range. Um, we have quite a range of metallicities in the nuclear star cluster from subsolar to supersolar metallicities. And um, so if uh, one does higher resolution spectroscopy, it was shown that the highest value um, in the nuclear star cluster is indeed 0.62 or 0.5 dex. <clears throat> and the um, metallicity distribution is also important to understand, um, to derive the star formation history of the nuclear star cluster. This, uh, what I show you here is work by Zhu Chen, which, and I hope this paper will be accepted soon. So she showed that you have to consider the metallicity when you look at the star formation history, because if you just consider the the effective temperature and the K-band um, to fit the, the star formation history, you will have um, stars that you cannot really explain that are too warm if you assume they all have solar metallicity. But if you consider the metallicity, then you get a much better um, fit. And the best fit that she derived was that you have a two-burst star formation history where the first burst uh, produced 90% of the stellar mass and supersolar metallicities um, with an age of three to eight giga years, which is um, shown here in this probability density plot. And then there would be a second burst with low metallicity, but here uh, it's not really possible to constrain the age. The, the probability density basically reflects the uniform prior. Okay, and we also found that the stellar kinematics varies with the stellar metallicity. This work was led by uh, Tuan Do, and he made a two-population Gaussian mixture model of um, that took into account both the radio, the line of sight velocities of the stars and their metallicities. And he found the best fit with two populations, and one has um, about 90% of the stars with supersolar metallicity, and then also a contribution with low metallicity. And the interesting thing about these stars is that they rotate faster. So here we have the line of sight velocity map for supersolar metallicity stars, and these are the subsolar metallicity stars. And not only rotate they faster, maybe the rotation axis is tilted with respect to the galactic plane. But here the uncertainties were too big to be sure. But both um, the super and the subsolar metallicity stars have a similar velocity dispersion and also similar colors. And this tells us they are both located in the in the potential, in the same potential inside the nuclear star cluster. And we are not looking at foreground populations here. And Manuel Arcaceda used n-body simulations to test if a star cluster infall could explain the subsolar metallicity stars. 
So he simulated the orbital decay of um, 10 to the 6 solar mass star cluster in the galactic nucleus potential. And here I should mention this infalling star cluster it could, of course, be a globular cluster, but it could also be the nucleus of a dwarf galaxy. And um, he started the simulation started 50 parsec. Um, after about 60 million years, this cluster reaches the central 10 parsec. And once it reaches this region, then it will be dissolved very quickly. Here you see four um, snapshots. Here we have the nuclear star cluster, and here the infalling star cluster. And you see if in these snapshots how it gets. Um, how it decreases in size and gets smaller because stars are being stripped away. <clears throat> so it dissolves in a few million years. However, um, the kinematic signature of these stars should persist longer, um, but at most three giga years. So um, if really the subsolar metallicity stars are from an infalling star cluster, this in this infall likely happened not longer than three giga years ago. And uh, also, um, he checked if the resulting metallicity distribution would match what we observe, and he found agreement um, from the simulations and the data. And now, um, when we move further out, away from the central four parsec squared, um, there we observed six more fields with KMOS. And um, there are 600 red giant stars, and I again measured the metallicity distribution, which is actually quite similar to what we have in central four parsec squared. And here we looked at the spatial distribution of the red giant stars. This is shown here. So um, in this map, um, basically the color gives you the metallicity of a star. And the darker the color, the lower the metallicity, subsolar metallicity stars are shown as squares. And we see that there appear to be more of these stars in the galactic north. But overall, the distribution of the stars is not uniform. Um, so I made a color, an extinction corrected color cut. So we only look at stars in a certain magnitude range um, from 7.5 to 10.25. But still, um, because extinction is higher in different regions, there are not as many stars here overall. So to really be sure if this is um, what we are seeing is real, um, I applied Voronoi binning and looked at the fraction of subsolar metallicity stars in different regions. So Voronoi binning means you take um, a region of a minimum number of stars. Here we have at least 20 stars per bin. And in this bin, you take all of the stars and compute the fraction how many stars have subsolar metallicity. And what we found is in the galactic south, um, the fraction can be less than 10% in an, and in the galactic north, more than 20%, which gives a gradient of 2% every 10 arc second. And um, we also tested how robust is this um, result. So by selecting different stars, by choosing different magnitude cuts and extinction cuts, varying the binning of the Voronoi map. And I also uh, made simulations where I used all of the stars and randomly distributed them. Um, so I basically shuffled the metallicities and again created a map like this and checked how likely do we get a gradient that is also of the order 2% every 10 arc seconds. And this was only the case in two out of 5,000 um, runs. So it seems that this asymmetry is um, real and not just some binning effect or selection effect. We can also look at the metallicity distribution in different regions. So in the galactic south, where we don't have many subsolar metallicity stars, we have basically here the metallicity distribution in black. And this is just one Gaussian peak, basically. And in the region in the north, we have, we have more low metallicity stars. This is the red. We have a similar mean metallicity of the, of the major population but we have this additional bump of subsolar metallicity stars. 
So it's not um, a shift of the of the metallicity distribution. It's really just this um, higher number of subsolar metallicity stars here. And um, of course, there are so many open questions. Um, how could this be? How far out does this asymmetry go? Um, maybe can we trace a past merger event? So I proposed follow-up observations with KMOS, um, almost 1,000 stars that we observed in the summer. And here it's not in the mosaic mode, but in the MOS mode. So we have 20, the IFUs placed on 24 stars in several configurations. And um, yeah, so this is work in progress, but I will measure the metallicities of these stars, see how far, where are the subsolar metallicity stars, and maybe also try um, some dynamical modeling that considers the metallicities to learn more about what's going on here. And now I want to leave the central nuclear star cluster and talk about um, the region where we get the influence of the nuclear stellar disk. Um, so we have two fields um, in the, along the galactic plane in the east and west of the nuclear star cluster at about 20 parsec distance from Sagittarius A star. And in these fields, we are in the regime of where we are kind of in the middle between nuclear stellar disk and nuclear star cluster, because um, here the, the densities of these two structures, the nuclear star cluster here as a dotted line and the solid line for the nuclear stellar disk, they intersect roughly at 20 parsecs. So um, we have uh, more than 200 stars in each of these fields. And of course, I measured the metallicity distribution. So this is what we see here. Black is for the eastern field and red is for the western field. And overall, they, those two agree um, very nicely with a similar median and also 25th and 75th percentile. In comparison to the nuclear star cluster data, which is shown here in blue, we see that the metallicity distribution is shifted to lower metallicities. And then we also compared it with the nuclear stellar disk um, data of um, Fritz et al. So here um, we have also KMOS data that was observed in MOS mode, and you see where these stars are located. I only selected here the stars um, in this brown rectangle. And in brown, you see the metallicity distribution of the nuclear stellar disk, which is overall shifted to lower metallicities. And it's also narrower. And here we see the, metal, the mean metallicity as a function of galactic longitude. So it goes out to 200 parsec um, along the nuclear stellar disk. And um, here, the orange data points are just using a wider range of galactic latitude here to get less scattering between the data points. <clears throat> and um, yeah, we see that the metallicity of the nuclear stellar disk is lower than of the nuclear star cluster. If we would assume a linear gradient for the nuclear stellar disk, then we have in the center a metal, mean metallicity of 0.15 here, but what we measure in the nuclear star cluster is three sigma higher. This is the mean metallicity of more than 0.25. And here you see also that the metallicity, the, the sigma of the metallicity distribution is lower in the nuclear stellar disk. So um, this is probably a sign that we have distinct stellar populations and distinct star formation histories in the nuclear star cluster and in, and in the nuclear stellar disk. And is there time for two more slides, Rainer? Yes, sure. OK. Then um, I want to talk a bit about the early type stars that we also found in this region. So there are five uh, young stars in the east and four in the west. Most are O and B type stars. So we have bracket gamma absorption. One is a wolf rayi star. And for the OB type stars, um, knowing that they are OB type means we also know roughly their intrinsic color because all of the um, O and B type stars are roughly here along this line. 
And this um, is, however, where the colors that we that were observed. So we know the extinction law. This means we can shift the our photometric uh, photometry of these young stars on the um, intrinsic color line. And this means we get basically the H and K band magnitude of these stars for each star individually. So we do not depend on an extinction map that is always averaged by several stars. And when we know these um, values, so the H and K band photometry, we can compare it with parsec isochrones to derive stellar parameters like the effective temperature of the star and the uh, luminosity. So I used parsec isochrones in the age range of one to eight million years and from sub to supersolar metallicities. And for each star, I derived an effective temperature. And now we can look um, where these stars will then end up on a Hirschsprung-Russell diagram. Um, so these are our um, measurements um, and we can compare it with um, isochrones. So the different plots are for different metallicities. The different colors are different um, ages. So first, um, both in the East and in the West field, we um, have basically agreements. So both they are compatible with being the same population and we don't have different ages in the East and in the West. And um, so the preferred ages are in the range of 2.5 to 6.5 million years. And we have preferably supersolar metallicities. So, um, I thought about what could be the origin of these stars. Um, so it's not uh, unheard of that there are isolated stars, young isolated stars in the galactic center. Such stars have been discovered before, and it was suggested that they form in isolation or possibly in small groups. But of course, it could also be that they formed in clusters and then they were ejected and somehow left their birthplace. And the candidates for such a cluster origin are then the central parsec cluster and arches and quintuplet cluster. So arches is here, and this is where quintuplet are, is in relation to our two fields. And of course, it could also be that there was another cluster that is now dispersed and we don't see it anymore. And possible mechanisms to eject these stars would be supernova explosions or um, three-body interactions, which would then distribute the stars in random directions. And another way would be tidal stripping. This means um, when we know the orbit of the star cluster, we know where the stars would end up because they would basically follow the orbit. We um, know the orbits of arches and quintuplet roughly. They both move to the galactic east. And when one computes back the orbit, um, we see that in the past it moved um, not so far away, um, not so far distant from our two fields here. So the projected distance is um, probably around two parsec. And this happened at least once in the lifetime of quintuplet. And um, when uh, one does um, n-body simulations of the orbit, you see that these um, clusters will get uh, um, will create a trail of ejected stars shown here in green. And you also see where our fields are in relation. This is where the cluster is now. Um, yeah, so it's possible that these stars um, are the tidally stripped stars of quintuplet. And I also compared the line of sight velocity dispersion. So for quintuplet, we know it's 17 kilometers per second. For our Western field, we have 21 kilometers per second, but these are only three stars because, um, yeah, so we could not include the wolf -Rayi star in this analysis because we cannot measure its velocity. In the East field, we have five stars and the velocity dispersion is higher than in quintuplet. So um, it could be that some of the stars in the East field are indeed from quintuplet, and however, not all of them come from tidal stripping. So I'll come to my summary slide. 
nuclear star clusters can grow via star cluster inflow and gas inflow, followed by star formation. In the Milky Way nuclear star cluster, we have found young stars are very centrally concentrated, so they probably formed in C2. And if we go back to our star formation history plot that I showed you earlier, we have young stars here, but actually we don't know its metallicity. We cannot measure the metallicity from the hydrogen and helium lines, unfortunately. And in the, in the 20 parsec distance from the supermassive black hole in these two fields, we found isolated young stars. And they are consistent with being um, from quintuplet. Most of the stars are red giant stars, and they have a wide range of metallicities. And uh, most of them are supersolar. They probably formed in situ. But we found two red giant populations with different metallicity and kinematics. It's possible that a star cluster brought in the smaller population of subsolar metallicity stars. We also found that the subsolar metallicity stars are asymmetrically distributed. However, we do not know what the age, uh, if they have a different age or not. So this is still an open question. But these would be the stars here. And we also found that the nuclear star cluster is significantly more metal rich than the nuclear stellar disk. And this indicates that these two stellar structures have distinct stellar populations and star formation histories. Thanks. Thank you very much, Anya, for this uh, nice talk. And uh, okay, now the talk is open uh, for questions. Uh, maybe Rainer, if you want to manage the questions. Yes, I'm taking over. So thanks, Anya, wonderful talk. An immense amount of work you've done there. So are there any questions? Please come forward. Raise your hands. No nuclear star cluster specialists here. Let me start with a question here. So Anya, the, the um, massive stars that you found, uh, at what you presented at the very end, um, I, you, 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 you mentioned two concepts there, tidal stripping and ejection of massive stars. So can the massive stars actually have an origin in tidal stripping? Because I would expect them to be very concentrated towards the cores of these clusters originally. Um, I mean, what, what this simulation, this is not your work, I, no. I, I imagine. So this is tidal stripping, what they simulate, right? Yeah. It's not ejection what they simulate. I think it's just um, tidal stripping, yeah. And do they make an estimation how many massive stars and how many not so massive stars can be in there? I know um, it's not your work. I'm sorry about asking you about something that is not your work, but it's it's intriguing. Yeah, um, I think they they looked at different masses, but yeah, I I don't know for sure. Okay. I think. Maybe they have, I think, the, yeah. I don't know exactly what this means now. If uh, maybe the black are the massive stars and yes. the not so massive stars, but I would have to go back to the paper. Okay, I, I have to check this out, this paper. Yes, this called my attention. I didn't know it. Thank you. And when Manuel Arcaceta simulates his cluster, I mean, I know I've heard of many simulations and it's extremely hard to bring stars into the central parsecs with a cluster that spares in. So does he assume, a, uh, I know he, he assumes a very massive cluster, but does he put an intermediate mass black hole there or assume a very high concentration of stars towards the center to bring it that close? Yeah, I think there was an intermediate mass black hole. Okay, thanks. So yeah, I, that, that explains how you bring stars in there. Yeah, it doesn't really matter in the sense of how fast the cluster is disrupted and how far how long the kinematic signature remains there but i think yeah there were there was an intermediate mass black hole in the simulation i think it does matter to bring stars into the central one or two parsecs because if without that i think it's very hard to bring a, to bring clusters that close in i think most of them but i'm not sure that's just what i have in, in mind from earlier 
from, I mean, 10 years or 15 years ago, these simulations were all the rage. Mm -hmm. And that's what I remember. Well, anyway, super impressive. I'm really looking forward to what you get with these new KMOS observations. I was going to ask you, what are you going to do in the future? But you told already, so this sounds really cool. I see we have a question by Isabel. So thank you. Thank you very much, Anya. A really wonderful talk. Um, um, I'm, a, I'm working on the stragalactic astronomy, so um, I'd like to ask you if there is any possibility of making the connection with such, uh, I mean, or, or at least as much as possible uh, depth with the, in, in other, in, in external galaxies with the kind of things, or, or just trying to uh, make statistics with external galaxies and see how much the, uh, what, what you're seeing in our own galaxy is applicable to the other ones. Yeah, I think that's what's happening a lot. So people look at, for example, the occupation fractions, how many galaxies have a nuclear star cluster, what are their masses. But um, sometimes you can also already derive the star formation history of individual nuclear star clusters, but then it's usually the entire nuclear star cluster and you cannot see really spatial variations there. So maybe that uh, would be will be possible with the ELTs, but for now it's usually one uh, value for the stellar population or star formation history for an extragalactic nuclear star cluster. And and, and the questions you've raised uh, with the uh, problem of not having observed or, or at least uh, enough uh, high metallicity stars for for making models. Uh, it also impacts the extragalactic results, of course, because we use the same models. So do you have any idea how to what to do to to provide any kind of a, of a, I mean a improvement in in those respects? So uh, I did not mention it, but we also made some uh, well, the models that we used have um, metallicity, so we did not consider what that individual elemental abundances could be different. So when we say M over H, this means iron over H is enhanced the same way as alpha over H and alpha over iron would be zero. Mm -hmm. This is because at the spectral resolution, we cannot measure individual elemental abundances, but it could, um, so some studies of like 10 stars in the nuclear star cluster showed that some elements are enhanced. So it could, um, so this should be, um, this could explain why we get these biased weird results for the metallicities yeah but i was most i mean my, my question was um, more related to the fact that we don't have uh, high uh, enough metallicity uh, stars observed stars to reproduce some lines that you're not able to do because we don't have them so um, yeah i just meant it's these may not be as metal rich as they appear to be uh -huh. because maybe the yeah, super solar elemental abundances bias our results to very high metallicities. So I, yeah, for the Milky Way, I don't think we can say for sure that we have such high metallicities, but mm -hmm. if we want to, but, but it's still the place with the highest metallicities of stars. So in principle, the things like SDSS5, where you have very well calibrated data sets, it will be great to really compare the stars and be sure that these metallicities are real mm -hmm. but stars in the galactic center as i said have very high extinction so when you find these very high metallicity stars yeah we cannot compare it with the optical but, but you need did you need a spectral the infrared right so sdss is yeah it? sdss is in the h band it's so also I, in the h band okay I know most extra well several extra galactic studies look in the optical so even if we have from SDSS verified, this is a 0.6 dex a metallicity star. We don't know what the optical spectrum will look like if it's mm -hmm. in the nuclear star cluster. So yeah, we can just hope that SDSS 5 finds other stars like that, mm -hmm. not in the galactic center. But the highest metallicities are in the galactic center, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you and congratulations again for such a nice talk. More questions? Don't be shy also to ask more fundamental questions. Nope. Um, no one? No? Okay. Okay, I think uh, 
So Anja, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. This is very impressive work. And I hope to see you maybe in April at the Galactic Center workshop. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye.